for the introduction and thank you Diego for the invitation and Kathy for all the logistical stuff. It, I'm truly, truly uh, thrilled to be here, uh, not only for the lovely weather outside, uh, and I do appreciate your coming out here on the last day of the term, um, 5 to 7 p.m. So thank you all. <laughs> and uh, as Tim mentioned, I've been working for a while now on a book length project called The Dragoman Renaissance, um, Diplomatic Interpreters and the Making of the Levant. And what I'm about to present is a small outtake from, from this project that really seeks to uh, speak to new diplomatic history, even though I was not trained as a diplomatic historian myself, and to um, kind of resituate Istanbul at the heart of our thinking about early modern uh, diplomacy, um, and uh, to think about the practitioners of, of diplomacy in Istanbul as important to the articulation of a civilizational discourse the idea of um, separate civilizations, uh, geopolitical categories such as Europe, the Levant, um, and the rest of it. And in, in some sense, it is an intervention in the ongoing debates about Orientalism, but also seeking to kind of shift uh, the discussion a little bit from um, what I think is less fruitful um, focus on periodization. Did Said get it right or not? Did it start with Napoleon or not? I think we're kind of past that. Um, and also move away from a discussion of representations into a discussion of Orientalism as a set of scholarly habits, methods, uh, epistemologies. And in that context, to think about dragomans, about diplomatic interpreters operating in Istanbul as important for what I think is a really a dialogically emergent uh, set of practices that arise out of intense interactions with Ottoman elites and in some ways embody um, this articulation of something that is very much shared or emerges in this context of interaction rather than um, an imposition from the outside, um, a misreading, a misrepresentation, if you will. Um, I should also acknowledge that this, what I'm about to present today, um, first of all, is um, an extended version of a paper that I initially gave in a wonderful panel uh, on networks of knowledge production in the early modern Mediterranean at the most recent AHA, organized by a young scholar named Alex Bevy Lacqua, and I'm very much indebted to him for inviting me to that panel. Uh, and also, in the spirit of what I'm about to present, that this is very much a uh, the, the result uh, or the tentative ongoing result of a collaborative project where uh, my uh, graduate students um, who have been working on this project have made very significant contributions uh, not least in the sense of working with multiple language codes uh, um, and, and interacting with genres of documentation with which I'm not myself familiar. So without further ado. The starting point for my talk today is a short letter sent by Giacomo Tarsia, an Istanbul-based diplomatic interpreter in Venetian service, to Lord Paget, English ambassador extraordinary to the Ottoman court, in June 1695. The letter, written in Italian, discusses Paget's commission from Tarsia of a translation of an Ottoman chronicle spanning the years 1642 to 1682, a fateful period in Ottoman history and historiography. The letter speaks to the great intellectual fermentation of the diplomatic milieu of late 17th century Istanbul, where bibliophile diplomats were vying with one another to procure Ottoman manuscripts for several growing Oriental libraries with a royal university or privately owned. While the overall significance of Istanbul's diplomatic scene for the genealogies of the discipline of Orientalism is increasingly acknowledged, the epistemological implications of this diplomatic nexus, its personnel, structures, and procedures are still not well understood. These implications have to do with the fact that, as keen as they may have been to gain meaningful knowledge of their surroundings, foreign representatives such as Paget vitally depended on the mediation of localized underlings, secretaries, and especially dragomans or diplomatic interpreters, many of them Venetian trained. With a few notable exceptions, resident diplomats and other scholastically minded sojourners in early modern Istanbul lacked formal training in Ottoman Turkish, let alone in Ottoman history and literature. With limited contacts in local scholarly milieus, diplomat bibliophiles crucially relied on dragomans to identify worthwhile manuscripts to procure, to negotiate the acquisition, to translate the manuscripts once acquired, and to provide digests, glosses, and other appropriate context for the reading. Contemporary diplomatic correspondence from Istanbul bears out the central role of dragomans in framing the Ottoman world for their employers through a range of daily material and textual practices. 
Giacomo Tarsia, as will become clear shortly, was one such well-connected intermediary, equally at home at the Ottoman court and in Venetian patrician palazzi, fluent in multiple languages and adept at serving multiple masters, at times concurrently. It was likely through his advice, if not that of his brother Tommaso or another dragoman, that Paget purchased the unidentif unidentified Ottoman chronicle, which is the subject of this letter. Beyond the platitudes of patronage, what we have in Tarsia's letter to Paget is thus the condensation, condensation of multiple levels of med mediation, historiographical frameworks, and linguistic codes, with the dragoman's polyglot habitus and implicit claim to local know-how as a linchpin of a broad system of material circulation and semiosis lodged in the specific institutional context of Istanbulite diplomacy. Little of this complexity of mediation can be gleaned from simply observing the fact of epistolary exchange between Tarsi and Paget. Yet the current vogue for social network analysis among historians of early modern knowledge production has invested tremendous resources precisely in mapping epistolary exchange. Of particular note here are massive, uh, sorry, massive recent digital projects such as mapping the Republic of Letters, cultures of knowledge, electronic enlightenment, and e-epistolarium to name but a few. Whether explicitly or implicitly, these projects treat epistolary exchange as a metonym for weak ties between senders and recipients that supposedly helped congeal the Republic of Letters. While impressive for their sheer scale, robust critical apparatus, and sleek visualizations, mm -hmm. such, projects <laughs> <laughs> well, such projects seem to pay little attention to the inherent volatility of knowledge as it was crafted through multiple technological and institutional matrices that far exceed the form of the letter. Communication in early modern Istanbul and elsewhere, it is worth recalling, occurred not only through manuscript exchange, but had important oral dimensions as well. Even in its scribal iterations, it was premised on less than exacting textual citation and attribution practices, particularly when it came to documenting interactions, whether oral or written, with social inferiors and confessional others. Thus, any account of knowledge production in early modern Istanbul, based primarily on epistolary, on epistolary exchange, is bound to unduly privileged sojourning upper-class European agents. Indeed, such accounts which still predominate textbook discussions of science and empire in the early modern world align too neatly with prevalent bootstrapping understandings of Orientalism's genesis in European imaginaries. They not only underestimate the significance of European scholars' interactions with Ottoman peers and their myriad textual forms in generating insights on Ottoman worlds, but also gloss over the mediated nature of the knowledge thus produced and its institutional embedding in Istanbul's chanceries and divans. My immediate goal in this paper is thus to decenter and declass, if you will, the all too Eurocentric and scholastic vision of the Republic of Letters that recent visualization and mapping projects perhaps unwittingly reinscribe after decades of very compelling scholarship to the contrary. I also aim to underscore the limitations of social network analysis and their big data methodologies for theorizing knowledge production more broadly. To be clear, network visualizations may yield highly valuable fresh insights about the shifting routes and intensities of early modern epistolary exchange. But at the same time, they risk leaving out essential communicative practices that cannot be captured by even the most sophisticated, dynamic, and diachronically quantitative mapping of letters sent and received. Indeed, the current vogue for network analysis has shifted some historians' attention away from the process of knowledge production and back to text artifacts as bound, fixed objects with the points of supposed departure and arrival, a sender and a receiver. As Anne Blair, Tony Grafton, Paula Finlan, and others have masterfully shown, the circulation of text artifacts should not be conflated with the circulation of texts, which are in fact grounded firmly in specific sites of enunciation. And I realize this may be an obvious point for a lot of literary scholars. Um, this epistemological caveat requires that we rethink our denotational model of the text, as so much linguistic anthropology has convincingly shown. In other words, if network and circulation are a convenient shorthand for thinking about the movement and an even distribution of text artifacts, it should not be mistaken for the knowledge that such artifacts are assumed to contain knowledge which is inherently mediated, interpersonal, and situated 
shaped by its material forms, but not predetermined by them. If we take too literally the terms network and circulation, let alone the other current terminology of exchange, transmission, and flow, we risk leaving out what anthropologist Anna Tsing aptly calls friction, the messy and complex practices that constitute and reconstitute knowledge. My point here, hardly original, is that human knowledge does not circulate the way digital bytes are supposed to in prepackaged, self-contained more cells, but rather needs to be reconstituted each and every time it is invoked. As linguistic anthropologists and media studies scholars of the space of flows are increasingly showing, this is true even of our hypermediatized era, and it is certainly the case for earlier moments. Yet the problem with social network theory as it is now applied to early modern history seems to me to go beyond the question of entrenched denotational models of the text and ideologies of textual stability and to the heart of our ideas about subject formation. In keeping with classical versions of social network theory, many historians seem to have unwittingly adopted a transactional model where nodes are treated as a priori primary units of analysis and are moreover envisioned as engaging one another in a largely utilitarian and goal-oriented exchange. Other approaches, whether Nicholas Luhmann's systems theories, Bruno Latour's actor network theory, or John Paget's biochemically inspired autocatalysis model, all offer valuable critiques of intentionality and demonstrate how nodes are relationally constituted. Indeed, these theories' multiple points of intersection underscore the inherently open-ended nature, not only of any network, quote unquote, but even of the a priori distinction between nodes and ties, subjects and objects. These theories, however, are yet to be engaged by most historians. So it's a very modest nod in that direction. In what follows, I seek to move away from treating diplomatic personnel as nodes and their textual artifacts as ties. Instead, I propose that we take a more Latourian view of the system of circulation that constituted and was constituted by early modern Istanbulite diplomacy. Such a view requires that we let go of our notion of the inherent mastery of humans over non-humans. For example, what if we consider documents or even genres of documentation as our nodes and the humans involved in their production and consumption as admittedly rather messy ties? What if we go further and treat certain documentary practices as nodes and consider how the institutional sites, personnel, genres of documentation and material conditions of textual production and circulation are all relationally constituted in a dynamically evolving system rather than provide a context, pre-existing context, um, for uh, their, uh, their production. Such moves pose multiple methodological challenges which I have by no means resolved. What I'd like to do today though is offer a case study a case study of Dragoman's practices of translation and self-representation as one way of getting at some profoundly mediated forms of knowledge production and subject formation and the early modern Mediterranean that they helped both weave together and unravel. My paper focuses on two brothers, Tommaso and Giacomo Tarsia, who worked as Venetian Dragomans in their native city of Istanbul for over half a century, from 1660 to 1715. Until recently, the few studies devoted to dragomans aimed mostly to reconstruct individual biographies and familial genealogies, with the underlying premise that dragomans were marginal, if heroic, figures, Europeans who operated in a hostile and foreign East. With a renewed interest in the early modern Mediterranean as a space of connected histories, however, it has become more and more evident that the very categories of Europe and the East need to be historicized relationally, and the dragoman's textual and visual output itself played a decisive role in articulating the multi-layered and evolving relationship between the Ottomans and their contemporaries. In fact, we now know that dragomans helped shape not only key aspects of modern diplomatic protocol, but some of the epistemological and methodological procedures of the emergent scholarly field of Orientalism. As I have recently argued elsewhere, Dragoman's practices of knowledge production were profoundly collaborative, involved a range of Ottoman and Venetian interlocutors, and belie any facile distinction between local and foreign, Eastern and Western. To illustrate the importance of Dragoman's positionality, their social ties and institutional coordinates for emergent practices of diplomatic knowledge production, and at the same time critically consider what such positionality might have meant at the time, 
I will first sketch out what we know about the Tarsia brothers' lives, activities, and contacts, and how we know it. I will then suggest why network may not be the most productive concept for capturing that knowledge. We in fact know a great deal about the Tarsias, as their careers involved substantial and varied documentation, leaving archival traces in several places, in their native Istanbul, in their employer's city of Venice, in their family's ancestral home of Capodistria, now Koper, in Slovenia, and in Zara, now Zadar in Croatia, which was at the time the Venetian colonial headquarters, and also, as suggested by my opening example, in London, England, outside this map, the set the seat of one of their several patrons beyond the Venetian consulate. Documents concerning the two brothers date back to 1660, when their father Cristoforo, himself a lifelong Venetian dragoman, successfully petitioned to enroll them in the service of the Bailo, the Venetian permanent representative to the port. From that point on, we have fairly continuous accounts of Tommaso's and Giacomo's career trajectories as their appointments and promotions were re registered in the Venetian Senate's deliberations, their juridical and financial privileges recorded in the Ottoman Register of Foreigners, the Ejnabi and Defterleri, their salaries, raises, gifts, and bonuses tallied in the Bailo's cash box, and their performance repeatedly reevaluated in diplomatic dispatches and end of term reports, the famous Relazioni. Enclosed with the Bailo's dispatches were sometimes petitions penned by the Tarsias themselves, which Giacomo especially was well positioned to present in person while in Venice. His appointment as road dragoman saw, saw him shuttle between the Serenissima and the port with every new envoy. And while Giacomo was gaining valuable first-hand knowledge of Venice, its diplomatic and political institutions, and the maritime and overland routes connecting it to Istanbul, his brother Tommaso was serving as a dragoman in Zara, affording him a good overview of Venetian colonial administration and ample opportunities to interact with Ottoman provincial governors in the ever mercurial Dalmatian borderlands. Eventually, in 1685, Tommaso was appointed Grand Dragoman in Istanbul, a position he was to retain until his death 30 years later. Giacomo II seems to have spent much of his time from the mid-1680s onwards in the Ottoman capital. Indeed, throughout their careers, the two brothers retained active business ties in Istanbul, as attested in numerous notarial records in the Bailo's chancery, and were committed members of the local Catholic community, of which Giacomo, like his father and maternal great-uncle before him, became prior in 1684. As for the substance of their work, the bulk of the Tarsia's daily activities involved oral interactions and as such was captured mostly as reported speech in their employer's writings. But we also have literally hundreds of translations that one or the other brother prepared of Ottoman official records along with copies of the ostensible originals. Many such copies with facing translations were collated in the Bailo's copy books and I'll come back to one of these translations at the end of my paper. In addition, the Tarsia brothers were involved in the, craft, in the drafting of several key treaties, including the 1706 Ahname, or Imperial Charter, granted to Venice by Sultan Ahmed III. And you can see their signatures there. And they also penned several other texts. In 1675, Giacomo translated a hefty chronicle by the Ottoman historian Hassan Vejihi, covering the period 1638 to 1660. In 1683, Tommaso composed a relazione about his tumultuous trip accompanying the Ottoman troops to the gates of Vienna earlier that year, and other writings crop, crop up in less expected places. About 50 letters by either brother to William Lord Paget, the English ambassador extraordinary to the port in the 1690s, are now kept at SOAS in London, and the opening example is one uh, such letter. Finally, we also have the two brothers' portraits from the 1680s, Tommaso's last will and testament from 1712, and an anonymous narrative genealogy of the Tarsia family from 1736. I'll discuss these last three items momentarily. One could go on with this list of materials and the density of connections it bespeaks, but my aim here is not to be comprehensive, but rather to point to the fragmentary and at times contradictory nature of these archival traces, each telling very different stories about our protagonists. The Tarsia dragomans are perhaps better documented than others, but their trajectories are by no means unique. Like most diplomatic interpreters in early modern Istanbul, 
They were enmeshed in extensive, far-reaching systems of reciprocity that encompassed a bewildering range of people, places, economic activities, material objects, including textual artifacts, linguistic codes, and genres of writing. Indeed, were we to tag and chart the movements of dragomans' writings and translations, material objects that they helped to procure, and the like, we could easily produce a digital map of the so-called networks that dragomans' labor spawned. Given that, and Dragomans' modus operandi as intermediaries par excellence, for whom networking was everything, why do I suggest that we should consider retiring the term network, or at least supplement it with other terminology that better conveys the me messy work of mediation? Ottoman historian Christine Filiou has recently warned us that, quote, those who became cosmopolitans, in scare quotes, did so not out of a desire for contact with people different from themselves, but to gain access to greater status, power, and wealth by connecting several insular groups in the Ottoman Empire." End quote. Her point leads to several questions. First, were the groups the dragomans connected uh, indeed insular? The answer seems to depend at least in part on the eyes of the beholder. In official context, Ottoman and foreign representatives certainly tended to rely on the mediation of dragomans for their interactions and not to engage one another directly, as in this miniature, which depicts Marco Tazia, this fellow over here, who, by the way, was Tommaso and Giacomo's uncle, in an iconic posture as the one standing in between Ottoman and Venetian parties around 1649. Note, however, that such forced mediation may have had to do with diplomatic protocol more than with a lack of a shared linguistic code, per se, or occasions for other forms of less structured sociability. Secondly, dragomans, while self-consciously performing the role of cultural intermediaries, were doing so as part of their professional habitus, not out of any ethical valorization of diversity or fostering communication between different peoples. We should be wary of ascribing to them sensibilities that clearly evolved later in the rather different epistemological landscape of proto-nationalism. If anything, dragomans actively emphasized Ottoman austerity, at least in part, to underscore their own utility as those who were adept at commensurating political and ethnolinguistic difference. Thus, in thinking about the production of knowledge in early modern Istanbul, we need to develop a conceptual vocabulary that allows us to study Ottoman difference, not as a pre-given fact, but rather as co-emergent with a range of settings, institutions, genres, and practices through which notions of Ottomanness were articulated. In other words, we might think about dragomans networking as process rather than about networks as channels, stable or otherwise, through which knowledge about the Ottomans seamlessly flowed. To illustrate the articulation of differences concomitant with Dragoman's varied practices of knowledge production, it might help to take a longer view of the Tarsia family trajectory as a whole. As Francesca Trivellato, Monique O'Connell, and Yuan Zhen Liang, among others, have shown in their respective studies, treating families as historical agents can yield insights about Mediterranean connectivity not perceptible at the individual level. Such methodology may, may also underscore how kinship-based networking belied retroactive patrilineal rationalizations. Starting in the late 1610s and up until the 1730s, the Tarsia family had at any given point at least one, and at times up to four members working as Venetian dragomans in Istanbul. If we count their maternal cousins, the Brutis and the Carlis, this dynasty's Istanbulite sojourn was even longer, beginning in the late 16th century and continuing uninterrupted to the late 18th. While in Istanbul, these men quickly became leading members of the local Catholic community, contracting business and marriage alliances with many of its elite families, a mix of newly arrived merchants and local-born long-established descendants of Genoese and Venetian settlers in Constantinople in the wake of the Fourth Crusade in 1204. And whereas Dragoman's daughters were sometimes sent back to Capodistria to be educated, sons and nephews were raised in Istanbul and groomed to be Dragomans from a very young age. This is precisely how Tommaso and Giacomo's father, Cristoforo, initially arrived to Istanbul in 1618 to apprentice with his maternal uncle, himself a lifelong Venetian Dragoman there, followed by his two younger brothers, and so on and so forth. 
around 1630, Cristoforo, Cristoforo married Battistina Zanetti of Capodistria, and the couple had five children. All three sons became Venetian dragomans, while both daughters lived in Istanbul through adulthood, marrying other dragomans. And while Tommaso was to remain celibate, Giacomo married, married Laura Mascherini, the daughter of an Ottoman court physician and the sister of another Venetian dragoman apprentice. In all, the Tarsia siblings had as in-laws at least five dragomans spanning three embassies, Venetian, French, and Habsburg. Meanwhile, their aunt, Cristoforo's sister, Bradamante, remained in Capodistria, where she married a local nobleman, Girolamo Carli. Their son, Gian Rinaldo, was to become a Venetian dragoman in Istanbul as well, working alongside his cousins, Tommaso and Giacomo Tarsia, and eventually inheriting Tommaso's title of Grand Dragoman in 1716. That same year, he also secured the title of Count. Now, I'm telling you all of this not because the details are so important, but because I think there are two narrative arcs that are implicit here that represent, I think, a common split strategy among elite families on the triplex confinium, the triple Venetian Ottoman Habsburg border in Dalmatia. Through marriage alliances, metropolitan education, and wealth accumulation, these families transformed themselves into landed aristocracies on the one hand, and into professional urbanites in the larger metropoles of Venice, Vienna, and Istanbul on the other. In this respect, a career in Istanbul was a desirable, carefully planned, and multi-generational path, not unlike others. Yet by the 18th and 19th centuries, we noticed the convergence and retroactive reclamation of the Istanbulite branch into the fold of the aristocratic family. As Capodistria's noble houses con constructed genealogies to prove their antiquity, noble blood, and loyal imperial subjecthood, patrilineal and patrilocal logics became ascendant. The Tarsia's genealogies genealogy, as I mentioned, is preserved in the family archives in an unsigned manuscript dating to the mid-1730s, penned in all likelihood by one of Giacomo's sons, Giovanni Battista, in the wake of a successful bid for a countship. With patrilineal continuity as their organizing principle, such genealogies reinforce a view of the noble paternal bloodline stretching back continuously for centuries, in this case, all the way back to 1275. Not surprisingly, then, these genealogies rarely treat Dragoman's 150 years long Ottoman sojourn and the vital kinship ties they contracted there as more than a temporary detour, a blip, a sacrificial act in the service of the Venetian Empire. Patrilineal by definition, these genealogies have little to say about maternal relatives, yet the recurring Christian naming patterns of Tarsia Dragomans and their children that recall matrilineal ancestors names like Cristoforo, Bradamante, and Giacomo, among others, remind us of the careful and ongoing cultivation of a final ties in Istanbul and elsewhere through wives, sisters, and daughters. This is evidently the case of the Tarsia dragomans, who through marriage became related to virtually all other dragoman dynasties at the port, and whose ability to perform their duties in Ottoman lands in the face of financial distress and political instability depended vitally on the real estate assets and highly localized juridical know-how of their female kin. We should thus be wary of reading the seamless patrilineality of Enlightenment aristocracies retroactively into the actions and outlooks of denizens of Istanbul, like the Tarsias a generation or two earlier, whose trajectories point to a very strong attachment to the local Catholic community, and despite their peripatetic careers, a resolutely metropolitan Istanbulite sense of place. And to give just a few examples of what I mean by that. By 1683, Tommaso Tarsia was deemed localized enough by powerful ministers in the Ottoman government to be offered the position of Grand Dragoman to the port after the falling out of favor of the former Ottoman Grand Dragoman, the Padua-educated Alexandros Mavroportatos. Tommaso's own will of 1712 is relentless, relentlessly focused on Istanbul and on the dragoman's immediate siblings and their descendants there, and to a much lesser degree elsewhere in the Ottoman Empire. It says little, if anything, about the Capodistrian branch of the family. The wills of Tommaso's Istanbulite sister, Angela, and niece, Vittoria, were written in Greek, the home language of most Catholic and Orthodox families in early modern Istanbul rather than in Italian, 
Even though in Istria, their ancestral home, Italian was a marker par excellence of urbanity and later, of course, cosmopolitanism, distinguishing its elite speakers from their Slavic-speaking surroundings. The unresolved tension in dragoman self-fashioning between the Istanbulite metropolitan grandee and the Capodistrian provincial aristocrat is well articulated in a series of portraits of members of the Tarsia and Kadri families, which originally hung in their palaces in Capodistria. The Tarsia portraits, which have illustrated my talk so far, are all part of this group of paintings. There is much about this fascinating series of late 17th century portraits that we still do not know. We do, however, have firm identifications of most of the subjects thanks to inscriptions on the portraits, as well as stylistic and iconographic evidence. Let us pause for a moment on two portraits in this group in particular, one of Bradamanta Tarsia Carli, Tomaso and Giacomo's paternal aunt, the other of Caterina Negri, Bradamanta's daughter-in-law, a native of Istanbul of Genoese descent, who married the dragoman Gian Rinaldo Carli, the Tarsia's first cousin. While Bradamante, as befits her Capodistrian patrician upbringing, is portrayed as an Italianate aristocrat, her daughter-in-law, though recognized in the inscription as of Genoese noble ancestry, is dressed rather as an Ottoman metropolitan lady. The same is true of most of the dragoman portraits in this series, who are dressed in the lavish garb of well-to-do Ottoman Christians. Their luxurious attire and nonchalant posture suggest the compatibility and even commensurability of Ottoman and Italian elite material cultures, but also their distinctiveness. The portraits make no effort to blend the two milieus, even though they were clearly intended to be hung in the family's palace in Capodistria, perhaps even commissioned as mementos from the relatives far away. Art historians seem to be in agreement that these portraits were painted by a provincial Venetian artist, probably in Capodistria, and given their dates and styles, likely beginning in the 1680s, that is, precisely when the Tarsia brothers and their cousin Carli, the likely candidates to have commissioned the works, were all serving as Venetian dragomans. Now, all three spent much of their careers in Venice and Dalmatia, where they most certainly did not wear kaftan, fez, and ermine-trimmed clothes. Why then this particular fashion statement? Perhaps we can see this as a carefully orchestrated form of self-fashioning, not at the individual level necessarily, but that of the dragoman segment of the Tarsia Carli family as a multi-generational whole, asserting its importance and sense of place. The preponderance of dragomans over all other members of the extended Tarsia family in this group of portraits is evident, supporting my contention that this was meant as a statement about dragomans' ability to both embody the distance between Capodistria and Istanbul and to commensurate it. This is further evinced by the fact that the two identified women in this group, out of a total of three, are directly related to dragomans. Bradamante, Cristoforo Tarsia's sister and Gian Rinaldo Carli's mother, the linchpin between the Tarsias and the Carlis, and Caterina ne Negri, Gian Rinaldo Carli's wife, who helped localize this branch of the family in Istanbul and to support um, her husband through uh, financial hardship, I should add. This group of portraits, I believe, aims to tell its intended audience back home a particular story about dragomans, the Ottoman world they inhabit, and the possible commensuration of difference, in part through kinship. It leaves out other aspects of the dragoman's social world, other affiliations and affiliations, other parts of their ostensible networks. And it crucially depends on the medium of a particular genre, Italian port portraiture, and its representational conventions to tell its story. This is but one example of how the knowledge that dragomans helped mediate was inevitably enmeshed in specific institutions and genres, belying a simple sender receiver model that is often assumed in analysis of social networks. My next example of dragomans' practices of knowledge production speaks even more directly to the role as diplomatic intermediaries who actively crafted knowledge and commensurated official genres and forms of governmentality. This text artifact comes from the Bylaws copybook, 
and is purported to be Giacomo Tarsi's reverse translation of the Ottoman rescript of a petition which the Venetian Bailo Giacomo Quirini submitted to the port around 1674. It's, it's complex. <laughs> it appears side by side with an ostensible copy of the Ottoman rescript of the, peti of the petition, a copy that was presumably prepared by an Ottoman scribe employed by the Bailo, probably from an authorized copy forwarded to the Bailo by the port to confirm that action had been taken on the original request. Okay? I use all these qualifiers, purported, ostensible, <laughs> presumable, probable, to signal the fact that much about the actual production of this archive is still unknown, although I'd be happy to elaborate on what we do know during Q&A. Moreover, the probative value of such copies in the case of a dispute over the substance of the originals would have been rather limited, as they were anything but authentic copies, lacking virtually all the markings of official Ottoman records. What then is the knowledge that these documents convey? What was their value and for whom? In his petition, the Bailo sought permission to bury a deceased merchant in the church of St. Francis in Galata. The annotations instructed the district governor of Galata, one Osman A, to look into the matter by verifying whether such burials were customary and in line with the existing imperial charter. Now, in Tarsia's Italian version, the petition's rescript appears first. So the Ottoman, the translation of the Ottoman summary of what was supposedly asked of the court by the Venetians. It appears first, followed by the two annotations in reverse order that makes little sense. And these annotations are presented as instructions issued by a kaimakam or a deputy. But this authorship of the kaimakam is nowhere to be found in the Ottoman version in the copybook. Perhaps both Tarsia and the Ottoman copyist were working from yet another version, or perhaps the procedural hierarchy of the Ottoman bureaucracy was already known to Tarsia, who felt the need to spell it out for his readers. As we can see, the two versions clearly differ in spatial organization. In the Ottoman version, the annotations appear at the top of the page. So these are the annotations right there technically before the petition, and their diagonal lines seem to attempt to replicate the effect of marginal notes. While in the Italian version, they follow the petition. So these are the two annotations following the petition, or the rescript, I should say. Beyond these, there are other important differences belying a simple notion of source and target text, to mention just a few. And here you have it color-coded to um, make it easier to follow. The Ottoman version refers to my sultan, sultanem, and our sultan, sultanem is, in the rescript of the Bailo's petition. So this is supposedly voicing the Bailo petitioning the sultan and calling him my sultan. In the Italian version, the addressee is referred to in the salutation as illustrissimo et eccellentissimo signore, illustrious and excellent signor, and then in the body of the petition as vostra eccellenza, your excellency, which as you all know, is a pretty generic honorific used normally to address a resident ambassador or a peer rather than a sovereign. Whereas the Bible's appellation in the Italian version is cavalier, knight, in the Ottoman version he appears as kulare, your slave, a formal marker of deference to the sultan by his subjects. Other, more subtle differences between the versions abound. The names of certain Ottoman official genres are translated and thus implicitly commensurated with Italian ones. So Ferman, a sultan edict, becomes commando. Kaiden, a record, becomes the registro. Atnamei Humeyun, imperial charter, becomes capitulazioni, the famous capitulations. And uh, but, but that aside, other um, nomenclature are rendered as foreignizing loan words. So Buyurdu, official order, becomes Buyurdi, um, as are the offices of Voivoda, uh, uh, here in the generic sense of an administrator, and Kaimakam, here the Grand Vizier's Istanbulite deputy. Even the designation of the deceased merchant as a French, the Ottoman term for a non-Ottoman European Christian subject, is rendered in the Italian version as Franco, Frankish, preserving an Ottoman juridical category, 
that was not likely to appear in the bylaw's original petition. I'm pretty sure it said uh, either Veneziano, if this was someone directly from Venice, or uh, Soggetto Veneto, or something like that to indicate Venetian subjecthood of some sort. These choices have several effects at once. They signal the translator's keen familiarity with the Ottoman bureaucracy, its structures, and official genres of documentation, and trust in that awareness being shared by his readers among Venetian political elites. By keeping the general categories and subject pronouns of the Ottoman text intact, but turning my sultan into your excellency and your slave into knight, it also quietly commensurates potentially explosive differences in perspective, subtly reinforcing the role of the dragoman in reframing the voices he channels. Obviously, Tarsia was not operating in a vacuum, but rather building on well-established conventions and textual procedures. And part of the larger project for me is really to identify what these uh, common strategies are and how they change over time to genres between individual dragomans to the extent that they do change. At the same time, my ongoing research into the translational practices of different dragomans also suggests, at least tentatively, that these practices varied considerably over time and among individual dragomans who were keenly aware of their addressees employing different translational strategies based on their presumed readership and the purposes of specific kinds of writings. In a wonderful book just published, The Whispers of Cities, John Paul Gabriel shows how diplomatic translation in late 17th century Istanbul sometimes involved teamwork as the linguistic competences of individual embassy dragomans were not always quite up to the task of bidirectional translation of official chancery records and thus necessitated collaboration with others whose skill set complemented their own. I think that we can safely extend the argument further and push the envelope on the very issue of cause and effect. Were dragomans and other diplomatic personnel at the center of networks which they spawned, or did, they, they, or did their operation within shifting constellations constitute them as subjects in the first place? Indeed, the term network at least as it is deployed in social network theory, seems to gloss over a basic problem with biographical reconstruction. What we know about our subjects' ties, the piecing together of data points about them and their interlocutors, may go against the grain of their very self-presentation at various spatiotemporal moments. And for dragomans, the strategic withholding of information about themselves, the crafting of different figures for different occasions, was a vital tool of the trade. I see limited analytical utility in simply condemning them as opportunistic or celebrating them as the harbingers of modern subjectivity and Mediterranean fluid identity, characterizations that presuppose some authentic, stable selfhood elsewhere as their yardstick. Nor do I wish to limit myself to reconstructing fuller biographies of these subjects and their networks. Rather, this paper has considered how the different genres and institutional settings across which dragomans operated, afforded them different kinds of perspectives and representational strategies. As I have argued, dragomans' textual practices were both informed by and instrumental in furthering the mutual imbrication of Ottoman and Venetian governmentalities. The knowledge they produced thus inevitably defies simple categorization. It was neither purely Venetian nor purely Ottoman, but rather should be treated as having helped direct the trajectories of both imperial centers in their ongoing engagements. So, such an approach serves to remind us of the inherent mixity, or rather trans-imperial nature, of bureaucratic practices across what in retrospect became two distinct regions, and that it was through the mediation of these practices, their ongoing recalibration in the work of dragomans and others, that our ideas of what was properly Venetian and Ottoman ultimately came about. Thank you. I assume you'll take questions? Sure. <coughs> With pleasure. Let's have some questions. Well, I can, I can go. I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try. So I, I, <coughs> thank you. That was great. Um, I love the notion of making the friction the topic. 
right, and putting just sort of flipping around where the center is and where the um, and where the where the node is and, and where the connection is. What I don't see is in service of what sort of project or question mm -hmm. you know you're you're quite doing that mm -hmm. um, because when you got to the end you were back to the sort of Venetian and Ottoman and the space between them. And so what I, I, I don't fully see yet what is um, if you if you are sort of consistent and want to follow through on taking mm -hmm. the friction as your subject, mm -hmm. right? That would ask for a history of friction, mm -hmm. right? Rather than a history of Ottoman subjects or Venetian subjects mm -hmm. and the relationship between them, which mm -hmm. is always automatically going to make these dragons mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the interstices again rather than the node. Yeah. Right? So I want to ask, like, is this a diplomatic history then in which it's about how friction changes over time? Or is it when you have Renaissance in the title, which is mm -hmm. interesting for the yeah. 1680s, is this a periodization mm -hmm. question mm -hmm. about, you know, the sort of uh, how these practices constitute different historical eras differently? Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm here. I'm just interested in what mm -hmm. the, um, it, you know, in service of what um, project mm -hmm. this remarkable sort of evidence of these people's experiences and and and, and, and mm -hmm. it's sort of internal coherence and meaningfulness of their project you know where do you want to go mm -hmm. thank you uh, this is uh, there are several questions kind of embedded in in what you just said and I'll try to kind of ferret it out I actually deliberately avoid the terminology of in between and may, perhaps I wasn't clear in my conclusion but my point is precisely that this is not about the folks in between Venetians and Ottomans but rather that they're actively involved in producing what becomes kind of prototypically Venetian, what becomes prototypically Ottoman, both in terms of kind of subjecthood and identification, uh, but also in terms of uh, genres of documentation and practices of documentation, archival practices. I'm very interested in the role of the Venetian consulate in Istanbul um, and its documentary production in the broader history of archival practice and how we think about documentation. And uh, this is a crucial period precisely because it is in the mid 17th century that administrators become keenly aware of the need to document and to refer back to precedent and, and, and to keep copy books that, are, that have indices and, and other uh, finding mm -hmm. aids that are much more sophisticated. So, so in part that's, that's uh, part of it. But so, so I think part of the project is to kind of move beyond a very metropolitan history of <coughs> Europe that always thinks of Europe in its engagements with others, but kind of takes an Atlantic model of Europe engaging in other rather than thinking about Europe coming into uh, its own in interaction with people who are never all that different. So you don't have a kind of an originary moment of encounter in the Mediterranean. You are dealing with the Ottomans who themselves see themselves as heirs to Rome are sitting in what was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, are deliberately imitating and building on Byzantine precedents, kind of incorporating various imperial traditions into their own uh, imperial language, uh, kind of synthetically incorporating all of that. So in that sense, I'm interested in how do these categories emerge out of ongoing interactions and in these spaces that are um, that are really difficult to pinpoint as either European or non-European. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's part of it. Periodization, yeah. So I use Renaissance tongue-in-cheek to some extent, but I do think that um, for, I think most of us early modernists are struggling with periodization and nomenclature in the sense of how do we think about this moment as being uh, genealogically very important for what comes after, but without necessarily um, doing this kind of um, self-serving history of modernity, right? So I think going back to the Renaissance in part is to reassert that these are important protagonists who are uh, building on humanistic notions of uh, the text, humanistic ideas of translation, humanistic ideas of rhetoric and effect and uh, uh, kind of authorship vis-a-vis -a, -vis a public but that are also 
doing this in interactions with their Ottoman peers and uh, so kind of broadening the frame of what, what is it that we talk about when we think about um, humanistic textuality um, and what, what kind of spaces, what kinds of genres um, are relevant or appropriate for, for this kind of history. Um, so I'm not myself a historian of Renaissance and humanism by any stretch, uh, but I am interested in the relationship of these Istanbulite figures to uh, this, particularly given their Venetian connection, the fact that many of them, uh, if not directly, then indirectly were trained in chancery practice, in notarial practice, in documentary practices, um, in the School of St. Mark uh, in Venice, and were kind of at least familiar with kind of canonical understandings of textuality that emerged from that Renaissance mm -hmm. moment, yes. A question that comes out of <coughs> pretty profound ignorance about most of the uh, figures that you're talking about. Um, I'm curious about the, um, I'd be curious to know more about uh, about the kind of controls that are that these figures are responding to. So, how are their communications received on one mm -hmm. side or on the other, mm -hmm. and what can we infer about um, about how their mediation is determined not not by their own sort of sense of being in the middle, but mm -hmm. by various kinds of yeah. vectors. And of course, there's behind that there's a whole extra set of methodological problems mm -hmm. because where do you find that information? Right. Uh, when does a communication rise to the level of being actually received by the Venetian Senate mm -hmm. or something like that? Right. Yeah. So thank you, thank you for this great question. Um, it's so the sh the short answer is that it's a mixed bag in terms of control. Because on the one hand, their employers can't really read the original, so they have <laughs> no idea whether this translation works or not. Um, and you know, some scholars have gotten a lot of mileage out of arguing that these are just a bunch of charlatans who are deliberately misrepresenting, and that this kind of epitomizes uh, kind of Levantine uh, shiftiness and the rest of it, so kind of a lot of uh, the Bernard Lewis uh, kind of understanding of, of dragomans. And I obviously am positioning myself in direct uh, uh, contrast to that kind of understanding. Um, but I do think that part of their ability to operate had to do, and this is very much in line with what we know of the history of, of uh, science more generally, with their ability to embody uh, a certain kind of elite Venetian habitus when interacting with uh, Venetian uh, uh, um, administrators and Ottoman um, elite status when interacting with, with their Ottoman peers. Um, we do find examples of multiple translations of the same Ottoman document being commissioned by the Venetian government and it's not always clear whether that was because the first translation was deemed to be sketchy or because it was just lost. There were multiple channels through which these documents traveled and sometimes a bylaw would get the translation and ship it along with the original to Venice in multiple uh, ciphers through multiple uh, routes and then it would get, one of them would get to Venice and then translated by another dragoman, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, there is a sense in which the Venetians were not always entirely pleased with the performance of the dragomans. Another useful source for that is the Relazioni because very early on an appraisal of all staff members, particularly all dragomans, becomes a de rigueur part of Relazioni, uh, these end of term reports that uh, uh, Bailey would stand up in front of the Senate and read for hours and hours mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> What's interesting about these is that they bear absolutely no relationship to the record that we have from other types of documentation, such as the dispatchy, the more regular uh, dispatches, uh, to the extent that you have dragomans that we know were corrupted through and through, were involved in all kinds of, you know, had a love affair with an Ottoman woman, did this and that and the other thing, and then the relazione sings their praise as the most loyal, trustworthy, wonderful uh, translator, or vice versa, someone who's dismissed and disgraced and sent out of the Bible's house, uh, on very dramatic charges of um, 
you know, sexual misconduct that borders on, on treason and then gets recruited and appears again in the documents two years later with no reference again ever <laughs> to any of that. I mean, none of this should surprise anyone who knows anything about politics, but it does right. say something, <laughs> yeah, but it, but it does say something about the fact that to a large extent the Baili are in, in the mercy of, of these drugs excuse me, these dragomans and highly dependent on them. Uh, and while they constantly, at least the, the more savvy Baili, always sought alternative uh, channels to access Ottoman officialdom and working through you know, Jewish physicians and other kinds of brokers to kind of um, perhaps dampen the effect of this uh, dependency, uh, it's very clear that dragomans were quite powerful and uh, the ones that were in, in office long term and reached high positions in particular like the Tarsias. But also you find, you find records about people who were um, on the payroll of the bylaw for decades in the lowest rung is apprentice dragoman, Giovanni di Lingua, language youth, well into their 60s and 70s, so quite far from their youth, simply because they couldn't be let go because they were quite powerful in what they knew and the fear was that they would go and take it elsewhere. So, so obviously, power is very much part of this. It's not just about linguistic competence, um, and the controls that were put in place um, were often deficient. I think it's fair, safe to say. Thank you. Uh, it's, okay. Okay. I have kind of a selfish question because I understood it from my own studies, but. Um, it's about the relationship between two of the texts that you were mm -hmm. mentioning, the genealogy and the portrait gallery. Uh -huh. um, I was just wondering if you could just talk more about the relationship, because it seemed to me that you were saying that the, the genealogy um, kind of left out the Ottoman branch of the family, and also the matrilineal aspects mm -hmm. of the family. And then it seemed like the port you were saying that the Ottoman branch kind of created a portrait gallery for themselves and then sent it to issue. And I was wondering, like, was the portrait collection trying to kind of be an appendage to the genealogy, or was it? Kind of no. So the, yeah. So so the the, the period is, the, the the sequence is important here. First of all, the, the genealogy doesn't leave out the dragomans. It does name all of them. It's keenly aware of their existence. But I think it kind of reclaims them precisely because it. Uh, positions them as you know just a small detour in the larger genealogy that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years and it's all very much focused on Capodistria. Uh, yeah. So for example there is very little reference to uh, their Istanbul families. Um, the fact that these people to, to a large extent were born and raised and died in Istanbul and uh, definitely did not consider Capodistria to be their major place of kind of self-identification, if you will. Uh, but the portraits are earlier. Um, as far as we know, and again, we don't know enough about them, but they date mostly to the 1680s, 1690s, early 1700s. So a good 40, 50, 60 years before the 1736 genealogy. And I think that's important because I think for the Tarsia brothers, this idea of fashioning themselves as landed aristocracy um, that is um, positioned very much in relationship to Habsburg and Venetian uh, overlords uh, would have been kind of jarring. They um, clearly, in terms of their their way of inhabiting a space in the world, they were very much of Istanbul, um, inhabiting this uh, position of grandees who are professionals, who are very worldly and traveled a lot, but are very much based there, have their connections there, are very uh, enmeshed in the local Catholic community, um, have their contacts in that city, and very much indebted to their wives for um, um, helping them. Um, 1680 is an interesting time because it's in the wake of the Venetian Ottoman War of Crete, uh, where for a good quarter of a century there was practically no uh, regular communication between Venice and the consulate. Uh, so there were dispatches sent from Istanbul to Venice, but very little reaching uh, the consulate back from Venice. And um, certainly in terms of salaries for dragomans, they were hardly paid during this period. So these dragomans who were working throughout the period, were very much relying on their local families to sustain them, um, not so much on Venetian salaries. 
Could I, could I think back on that just briefly? Ed? I mean, couldn't the genealogy serve a different, pur a different, but but related purpose, which is the kind of authorizing them as agents of Venice on the one hand, whereas they're, so that they have a couple of different identities. I mean, what makes them trustworthy in theory is that they're they really still are Venetian, uh, and the the genealogy seems to sort of suggest that more, whereas the, the portraits reflect a kind of experiential reality. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I would, I would necessarily assume that the portraits are more experiential than the genealogy, well, sorry, but, I but, yeah. but I, think, I think yes, I mean, these are clearly different genres with different purposes. Um, certainly, I think the genealogy is, is self-serving in, in presenting this kind of Venetian loyalty and, and claiming to have always been loyal Venetian subjects, ultimately what they want. And, and the, the, the date seems hardly coincidental. I mean, that's when they, they petition to get, um, to become counts and they're successful in their bid. So uh, I think this is, um, this is pretty interesting. The other interesting thing is that the person who in most likelihood crafted this genealogy is himself a dragoman. He's the descendant of these guys, but he pays no particular attention to the fact that he's a dragoman or to the fact that uh, much of the cachet of this family in the eyes of the Venetians would have been the fact that they were dragomans, not that they were the, you know, the holders of some tiny fief in, in, the, in Dalmatia. I mean, this would have been really <laughs> far less interesting to the Venetians, but this becomes a big deal, right? This becomes, this is our ancestral home and this is our aristocratic kind of house. Maybe yes? In continuation to the portrait, so again it's my sort of selfish <laughs> question and sure. history about um, Could you tell us anything about the, uh, this idea of cross-cultural dressing? Yeah, mm -hmm. I find it very fascinating. I think I realized that um, I might be wrong, but I think one of the male Members of the family was dressed in Venetian. So yeah, so it's interesting. Yeah. Cristoforo has the buttons that are very much the yeah. Venetian golden buttons. It's going to be like a like, certain division after this generation. Some figures are portrayed in more like the Eastern costume or something like that. Or, mm -hmm. um, I also find it interesting how female figures are dressed in very lavish costumes, whereas mm -hmm. male figures are more like bit more subdued because um, I thought about Van Dyke's um, portrait to Robert Charlie. Mm -hmm. um, he's dressed in Persian clothes, but they're mm -hmm. very lavish. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, like, he um, was, I guess, trying to say that he's a real ambassador right. from Persia. And then, so the lavish costume yeah. kind of like um, um, testifies that mm -hmm. he was sent by the Shah of Persia. So, I guess, like, what would be the messages that the um, yeah, so I don't know that I would say that they're more modestly dressed. I think part of the challenge is our yeah. perceptions of what is, um, I mean, so, so there's multiple ways of approaching this. One is to remember that in Venice itself, the highest members of the patrician class are always dressed in black togas, very, very modest. So there is the expectation of uh, male official dress, highly regularized and highly kind of subdued. I'm not sure that this would have been read as subdued or um, kind of non-lavish, um, because the, the, the trims that are very, very important are all ermine, which is um, certainly something that would have been considered as highly prized. Uh, the other <coughs> element of this is that this is official garb, and the Ottomans were very, like many other contemporaries, were very keen to regulate uh, official dress, and so dragomans were always expected to uh, wear certain kinds of costumes that bespoke um, their status as Christian subjects of the sultan. So this is important. They're being, uh, <coughs> they're expected to wear clothes that are not Venetian, but rather the clothing of members of local Ottoman Christian elites. Um, so I don't know that this is cross-cultural as much as kind of in inhabiting, embodying your role. So very much kind of uh, portraying something that is um, 
you are what you're wearing, right? Now, methodologically, it's also, I think, would be difficult to argue that we see here a kind of chronology or changing patterns of dress over time, because as far as we know, all of these portraits were created more or less in the same time. They're all very, very similar in style. So it doesn't seem, and, and certainly the older members that are being portrayed here, some of them were already deceased in 1680, some of them were very old by the time uh, these portraits are presenting them as youthful uh, dragomans in their 30s. So it seems um, unlikely that they had any say in their kind of presentation that this was more of kind of a um, concerted effort on the part of whoever commissioned this, and I think it was the Tarsias and the Kailis, although I can't prove it. There, we simply don't have any, as far as I know, we don't have any documentation about these portraits. Um, and art historians who have looked at them certainly have not come up with anything beyond the dating that comes from the inscription and stylistic evidence. Um, so I, I, I would be wary of saying this is cross-cultural. I would say that this is more about articulating uh, a subject position that is very much about embodying a certain role and a certain uh, space in the diplomatic context of Istanbul. Uh, if I understood correctly, um, at some point you said that um, Tarsia, probably Tommaso Tarsia, wrote a relazione at some point in the Venetian Senate. Yeah. So I was wondering, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about this text? And uh, also I would be curious to know um, what you think about relazioni. Uh, I think of this discussion among scholars, if, whether we can consider relazioni as ethnographic texts yeah. that describe the Ottomans or describe yeah. them. So thank you for this question. Uh, it's a fascinating um, text because um, as, as many of you will know, relazioni in general were supposed to be written only by ambassadors and therefore by patricians in Venice. To be appointed ambassador, you had to be a member of the patrician estate. And so we have a couple of examples of dragomans and other non-patricians writing relazioni. We have this one from 1683. We also have one by Giovanni Battista Salvago, who was another Istanbul-born dragoman who went to North Africa to ransom some slaves and negotiate uh, the terms of their release uh, in 1624, 1625. And earlier we have uh, two relazioni produced by a dragoman and a future dragoman going to Persia in the 16th century. Um, so um, there are some examples of that, but they're certainly very um, uh, rare uh, in the overall volume of uh, relazioni. And to me, these are fascinating texts precisely because they open up the question of how does one craft a narrative that is in line with the genre enough to be perceived as a, you know, an acceptable member of the genre, a token of the type, if you will, but at the same time it also asserts their sufficient authority to speak to the topics they're writing about. And Tommaso Tarsia was in a, in a tight spot there. He was sent, he's basically going, chasing, I can't remember all the details, but if I mem remember correctly, he's chasing Kara Mustafa, the, the Ottoman Grand Vizier, all the way to Istanbul uh, to obtain, per sorry, all the way to Vienna to obtain some permission to do something back in the consulate in Istanbul. So it's, he's not, he's not officially mandated by the Venetians to go as an ambassador, certainly. Um, and he writes this, um, if I, again, this is with a grain of salt, but I think he kind of, he's the one initiating the writing of this relazione. Um, so, so he's in a, in a strange position to begin with. Um, and it's certainly, 